Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Finwick Money Matters. I'm Nozi Pombandra and together with my co-host, Finwick editor Mark Ashton and Finwick.com editor Christia van Heeren, we will help you manage your finances and give you some of the latest trends and trades of the week. Now coming up in the next hour, how to get the big guys to buy your product. Our panel of experts gives us the inside scoop on tapping into the corporate supply chain. And in our trade of the week segment, Mark and I take a closer look at the Dow Jones and in personal finance does it still make sense to have an emergency fund plus we ask the experts the importance of market research before embarking on a new venture for all that and more do stay tuned In its cover story this week, Finwick gives entrepreneurs the lowdown on how to get their product into corporate supply chains while also looking at the pitfalls to avoid. Joining us now, we have advocate Thane Nieman from Galileo Capital and Dion Obelhoser, MD of Vraycom. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time. Um, let me first come to you first, um, Dion, and ask why is it so difficult uh, for, for small businesses to crack it into the big supply chain? Uh, chains of big corporates? I, I think we've hit for high. I think the problem is that it's a new world um, and, and a lot of people don't understand how big corporates think and how they right. apply their decision making process. Um, and, and it's like you, you're trying to stand there and, and, and catch candy falling over a fence and people say that there's a handout that's going to come your way. Actually it's not like that. You've you got to really go and push and dig yourself into there. And, and people don't know how to do that. So mm. I think it's, it's understanding how to go about getting people to notice you, which is the biggest challenge. Dion, I think one of the things that I often notice, and you talk to entrepreneurs, is they look at a corporate and they just see there's millions of rands, there's mm. millions of rands of marketing money, there's millions of rands in widgets, there's millions mm. of rands in catering supplies, etc. They see it as simply an opportunity to cash in. But reality is corporates are quite mercenary when it comes to dealing with business. They, yeah. they, they run to very, they, they often have financial managers, CFOs, etc. that are running these businesses down to the wire in terms of margins. W w when, when, you look at a, when, when you're a small business and you look at a corporate, how, how should you be approaching that relationship? I think, Mark, uh, the, the biggest challenge is this is not, if you look at it, for example, from a marketing perspective, this is not a shotgun, shotgun approach. It's a sniper approach. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand why they need your product. You've got to understand why your product is better. You've got to understand why your service is better. You've got to understand why they'll be better off buying from you. And you've got to believe in it yourself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they won't. Um, if, you, if you're not convinced that you have the best product in your particular category, mm -hmm. or at least understand what they are buying and how much they pay for it, and where they're buying it from at the moment, and why they are happy with what they get and why they are not happy, you, you're a baby in the woods. You stand there saying, you know what, maybe if I stand here long enough, I'll go to have a fried chicken mm -hmm. flying to okay, my face. Okay, then, but then I'll throw that to Thane, because one of the issues is enterprise development, and mm -hmm. it's one of my real bugbears, is that people see, well, we'll establish a, a small business, and it will simply cash in off a corporate mm -hmm. supply chain. But they don't have that. They don't have the wherewithal to be able to actually deal with the corporate. They don't have the scale, etc. Enterprise development. The, the reason I get un unhappy with it is that it is often just seen as we'll create a little business that's going to cash in on a supply chain and doesn't fulfil an actual role. I mean, what's your take on that? You know, Mark, there the, the are two issues around this. And unfortunately, sometimes the small business needs to start with the second issue rather than the first issue. The first issue is you've got to prove to the corporate, as Dion says, that you're capable of doing this um, development. You're capable of making a contribution. But are they capable? Mm. So it's not only about getting into the supply chain. That's very difficult. But it's actually proving to yourself that you've got the capabilities from a financial perspective, from an operational perspective, from an administrative perspective, and even from a, a logistic perspective. Can you actually do the job if you get given this, this tender or if you get given this, uh, this job to do for this big corporate? Let's look at how this is possibly a game changer once the small business actually makes it into the supply chain. Mm -hmm. How does it change the game completely from your perspective then? As a small business owner that has been involved with, with a corporate, what I find is that it's not a guaranteed uh, ticket going forward. You are almost con on a continual basis applying for a job. Mm. You know, so don't think once you've got the first job, you've made it. You actually have to continue and do not rely on getting the corporate work all the time. So what I like to look at it is there's a production line going. You need to do the small work to pay for the water and lights, the, uh, the bread and the, the salaries. And when you get the big corporate uh, job, 
mm. then that's when the cherry comes. But you have to keep working at it. Mm. Fane, how do you prevent uh, over, overreaching in that situation? So you get the corporate job, suddenly it takes up all your capacity. Mm. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. How do you prevent that from happening? Do you have to then, do you have to immediately start growing your business to have extra capacity to take on smaller jobs as well? It's, it sounds very cliche, but I think you need to do a business plan for that job. You've got to understand you're going to get paid after 60 days. I know there's some corporates that mm. will pay you on 30 days and they've, they, they, they've made that policy decision. But actually, cash flow could be a huge problem. So ideally, you would like to read the contract understand the cash flow implications and then go back and see whether you can cope with the cash flow whether you can cope with the the legal issues because remember it's not only your reputations at risk here yeah? mm. it's the corporate's reputation that's at risk as well as the procurement managers at risk right. so i think analyze 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 let me come back to the the argument that i often hear that uh, small and medium-sized enterprises especially black is always in the periphery it's always catering it's always the small services uh, at what point uh, is 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 a small business really ready to say that i want to be at the epicenter of the business model and really delivering on, on key business principles? I think it's a very good question. I think, and, and I almost want to start from another angle saying that one of the things with entrepreneurship is that patience is a virtue in the sense that sometimes doing the small stuff for many customers is right. actually the big stuff. <laughs> and, and you don't necessarily have to get the grandest contracts to make a good living. Yeah. You, can, you can get small business. I think it's more important that you do that one thing that you do extremely well and make sure that that customer will give you glowing references mm. when you want to add more to it. Because if he can trust you with a small contract, he's more likely to trust you with a larger contract. And other people are more likely to trust you with small contracts and then with larger contracts. I think if you expect to walk in um, like there's this mentality with tenderpreneurs where mm. uh, you just get this multi-million uh, multi rand tender and then you're rich. Uh, excuse me. Get a small one, deliver successfully. Get a slightly bigger one, deliver successfully. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have a s short story to tell about when you almost were rich and then you went out of business. Yeah. Um, I, I quickly want to look in before, Mark, you come in at the BE codes and whether you know these are, enabler, are an enabler for small businesses to get into the corporate supply chains of the big guys. Obviously, this, the answer is, is depending on whether you're black or not. Right. Because um, if, you, if, if, you, if you're a black entrepreneur, um, what the new codes do is they actually focus enterprise development towards supply chain. So um, what government has done with the codes that has just gone, come out on the 11th of October saying, guys, we know that you're spending millions of rands. We want you to spend it on the small black entrepreneur. Mm. And what we want you to do is we want to take your enterprise development budget that you have, for which you get points in the codes, and, and invest it over there so that your supply chain can develop. So it's actually a perfect storm in that right. opportunity. Mm. Where the problem comes in is these people don't know be of each other. There's a, a small black entrepreneur, and I mentored 19 from them from Soweto. They don't know how to get to the big corporates. And the big corporates are saying, no small black companies are offering me this product. And there's this chasm, and people mm. don't know how to build, build bridges. But I think that's the problem. Isn't that an issue across the board, though, for a small business to get into a mm. bigger supply chain? Uh, surely that's not only true for BEE entrepreneurs. It's not. Mm. It's not. I think the benefit that the that the, that the black entrepreneurs are getting now is there's now a mechanism on the corporate side that says, I can get a benefit to find you. Right. That has not necessarily been the, the right. case in the past, and that's quite important. Thane, one of the things you touched on there was uh, just using payment terms as the mm. example, but should the entrepreneur push back when they're dealing with the corporate? Because I think that often they, they just accept the terms that mm. get given to them and say, you will deliver X, this mm. is what we'll pay, how we'll pay you, this is what your mm. deliverables are, and they just say, yes, thank you very much. Mm. But the entrepreneur can actually push back, you know, rather, rather deliver on what you can deliver rather than overpromise. You've touched on a fantastic point there, Mark, because we as entrepreneurs, the small, especially the small business entrepreneurs, will always think we've got to be cheapest mm. so that we can get the job. Right. And it's about the value you offer. So I think you've got to be very careful of accepting the first price you get from, from the big corporate because we don't have the economies of scale yeah. that the big corporates have. So again, I go back to your, the fundamentals. If you have your financial uh, acumen in, you know, in place, you can say, well, can I do it for that price? Is it worth my while to do it? Because at the end of the day, I'd rather have no deal than a bad deal. Yeah. So yes, I think that, and I think the corporates are also very aware of this. And you need to price to your market. Mm. 
So if I'm dealing with the black entrepreneur in Soweto and I'm dealing the, with the co uh, consultant in Santon, there's got to be some sort of difference because of the value that I offer. Let's talk about uh, the small businesses on the sideline because you flailing their arms in the end saying, look at me, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. What should they be doing uh, in a practical sense to make themselves more attractive to the big guys? No, Zipa, network. But be careful of networking yourself out of business because a lot of us like to network <laughs> so much that we don't make money in the right. side, you know. So you need to network, get on, uh, go on to um, the search engines, search the companies, have a look where you, your niche is, um, read books, get the financial statements of the uh, companies that you'd like to deal with. Facebook, Twitter, all these are wonderful methods in where you can glean information and then focus your uh, proposal, not like a shotgun approach as Dion was talking about earlier, but a sniper approach. So there's a lot we can do. Fan, you wrote something in the article that really, um, that really struck me, maybe because we work in communications and it's something that we take mm. for granted, but you said that uh, a lot of businesses don't have the basics in place. They've got spelling mistakes, they don't have websites, they don't have <laughs> business cards. Is it worth it for a small business before you target a, a corporate to get a professional in to do that sort of thing for you? I don't think you have to. You know, for example, I'm not a social media fundi, but I just went onto the web. I then found five domains that I liked, and I, and I bought them for 625 Rand. So rather than have um, Thane at gmail.com, right. I have Thane at finman.co.za, which or it gives you that better uh, perception, that better uh, appreciation that, well, this is not just a small guy. There. So the perception, Krista, is so important. And it's with, with uh, modern technology, of Marcus, the, the, the Microsoft Office um, software, you can create yourself a wonderful um, letterhead instead of going to go and buy um, this off the, the, station, off the shelf stationery. So there's a lot we can do. Do you want to jump in here? And one of the things that, that, that I've kind of picked up over the last couple of years is that we're often in a hurry to start businesses. Mm -hmm. We're often in our 20s. We have no professional network to speak of. We then want to go and supply into Tiger Brands. We want to supply into SAA. But we have no network to speak of. We have no foot in the door. How valuable is age and actual experience in industry that you want to supply into before you know before suddenly jumping in and saying I'm now going to supply a corporate? I think Mark you raised an incredibly important point. Uh, I, I always advise young people um, that before you start a business in an industry have have five to ten years working experience mm. in that industry. If you want to supply a product to a large transport company have worked there. Mm -hmm. I mean, know the people from the inside. And then from that knowledge, why would you learn at your own expense? Because you will hit the deck. It is what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, it's much easier to learn at, at a big corporate's expense, um, get into their training programs, what they geared for that. Um, and, and especially, especially if you're a black executive wanting to get ahead a in life, mm -hmm. don't try to wake up one morning and say, I'm an entrepreneur, somebody's going to give me a contract and I'll be okay. Start on the process of saying, I want to specialize in a particular industry. Yeah. Now you need to know that industry. The best way to do it, get a job. Mm -hmm. Get a job in that industry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that really worry me about some of our, I would call it emerging enterprises, they're really subsist subsistence yeah. enterprises. And the, the moment somebody offers them a job, they'll take it. Mm. So they're not in business because mm. they're entrepreneurs. They're in business because they can't find a job. Yeah. Then they give up, and now they try to make a living. Uh, to get into big corporate supply chain is to get into that job first, yeah. because now you know everybody, yeah. and you can build those relationships. Critically. Do you, do you want to add something there, I'd love to, if I may. The problem is getting that job, Dion. Yeah. You know, there's so much unemployment out there, and we do have accidental entrepreneurs, as, as I like to call them. <laughs> but um, the other issue is, what about mentorships? Mm -hmm. We have such a shortage of mentorships, and I've had one or two people this year come to me and say, I'll work for you for free, I just need that work experience. Mm -hmm. So if you can't get the job, mm -hmm. try and offer your services, but mentorship is so vital. But is there not a, th th there's an issue there, and a lot of entrepreneurs want to be one-man bands, they want to be one-man rock mm -hmm. stars because they mm -hmm. see what they, what they, they see the newspapers, see the magazines, they see the TV shows that have so-and-so made it. <laughs> doesn't say anything about so-and-so's team that made it, it yes. was the individual. And I think that, you know, I, I, I see a lot of the entrepreneurs that come through, through Fin Week and that kind of thing, and there's very much the idea that it's a one-person success mm -hmm. story, whereas the bigger, more established businesses, you'll talk to a lot of the CEOs, and they say, we made it because 
because I had five or six good people around me. There's a yeah. wonderful tweet that I, I read th this last week, and it says, "You can, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go as a team." Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly. I want to put a, a, the the elephant in the room uh, on the table, if I may, before we we, <laughs> we go. And this is just the amount of corruption that actually happens along the mm. supply chain. I mean, how relevant and effective are company databases? And I'm looking at government in particular, because you know, entrepreneur needs to get onto the database, and then from the database, that's where you probably have an opportunity. But it's all about who you know in order to get to that database. Let me, let me throw that at you, Dion. I mean, are these platforms working? Uh, Naziba, let me say the following. If you're, a, if you're a young entrepreneur and you want to get into business, my advice to you is avoid government to start with. Um, there's a, rather find out in, 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 in the rough and tumble of the, of the private world how these things work. Don't, don't, because if you look at government, they often take six months to pay. They, they have processes. I mean, I, I had a claim from a university the other day where when they were three months late, they said, oh, I need a tax clearance certificate. They didn't ask me before the time. Another month is lost. Mm. Now, if you're on critical cash flow, you cannot afford that. Mm. So um, my advice is avoid government tenders. Um, get into business. And then when you're established, then go into government tenders. I think there's a fine line there because you, you I mean, Thane, as you mentioned, you need a network mm -hmm. and you people, you people are encouraged to use their networks to, to get ahead in business. Yeah. So where is the line between, between getting... Networking and corruption. Yeah, networking mm -hmm. and corruption. It's a very fine line there. We're going to leave it on that rather fine and tricky <laughs> line uh, and say thank you to uh, my guest Thane Niemann from Galileo Capital and Dion Oberhauser from Vericon. Remember that for these and more stories, get your copy of Finwick Money Matters on Shelves today. It's also available in both English and Afrikaans on mysubs.co.za. But before we head off to a break, let's take a quick look at our Finwick Trade of the Week. This week's trade of the week is the Dow Jones. Now, Mark, this is up 19%. It should be a feel-good story. What's your take? Yeah, look, I think it's been a good year for equities. Uh, the reality is everybody's just jumped on this quantity, uh, quantitative easing yeah. bandwagon, and it's just easy money at the moment. Unfortunately, the party is coming to an end. Whether we believe it or not, it is gonna, there, there is going to be a case for, for cutting back on QE. It's mm -hmm. just not sustainable at the moment. 19% is a great year for anybody in, in any kind of financial return. Um, U.S. just, you know, there's been this flight to capital and flight to quality in the U.S. and, and I think that that's been a big driver of that. Um, it looks like it, everything just feels expensive now and, and, and w when you look at things like government shutdowns last month, it looks like they're going to have another shutdown or some kind mm -hmm. of politics in, in January. It just looks like it, it feels expensive. It doesn't look like there's some kind of, th that, that, that it's sustainable as we're standing at the moment. Time to maybe take me off the table. So I'm hearing you gravitating very strongly to a sell and get out. Yeah, I think it's just it's it's a bit of downside protection if you want to buy it. Otherwise, simply take your feet out of the market and have a look again. If if, if you're an active trader, it's getting to the end of the year. It's silly season at the office. It's silly season in financial markets. It's silly season in global politics. It's just time to maybe take a, take a step back. It's just time to maybe take a step back. That's Mark Ashton uh, on his views on the Dow Jones uh, performance. It's time now for a quick ad break, but when we return, we talk personal finance. Welcome back to Finweek Money Matters. Between paying back debt, making smart investment decisions and planning for retirement, it's easy for the good old emergency fund to fall by the wayside. In a world of easy access to investment vehicles like ETFs, does it still make sense to have an emergency fund? To discuss this further, we have Kathy Lamas, a business development manager at Glacier by Sunlam, Alexandra Babich, director of Alexandra Babich and Associates, and we also have Dineo Tsamela, personal finance blogger at D on Money ZA. Everyone, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Kathy, let me come to you first. My, my, one of our previous guests, Thane Niemann, uh, walked off the set and said, I'm really going to watch this segment because I think it's really silly to have an emergency fund when you can have a bond. What's your response to that? You know, what's more important is not where you have it, but why you have it. Right. 
when you have it, and how big it should be. Yeah, I mean, I think Kathy, one of the things that I always find interesting, and I, I look at myself, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly ill-disciplined when it comes to it. You know, like if I see a, the Western provinces playing rugby, I'll quickly go and grab some money, go and put it into for my weekend punt, or we'll go out for a couple of drinks on the weekend. It comes down to, to discipline and actually knowing yourself from, from a personal perspective. Do people actually understand themselves and do they understand their personal finance habits particularly well? Sure, and, and the very nature of an emergency fund is that's exactly what it is. It's an emergency. It's an unplanned event that you didn't know was going to happen and you need to have that little nest egg somewhere to, to fund it. Mm. Do you know, let me uh, come to you on this. I mean, you know, at a time when uh, access to credit is not necessarily an issue with credit cards and the like, uh, do you find that people still consider an emergency fund as something that's important that they should have? Um, I think the emphasis on emergency funds isn't as... Um, you know, as reinforced as it should be. Um, because of credit cards and the easy availability of debt, it's so much easier for a person to think, I can just use my credit card because the emergency is happening right, happening right now. And they always think, I'll just pay it back over, you know, four, six months or however long. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll find that people will then go all out and exhaust their credit, you know, funds and access. And then next thing you know, they have no more you know, emergency money and they have no savings. So it's always important to have that money set aside. I think unlike uh, Mark, where for me, if Western Cape or Western Province, West that's what Province. Western Province is playing, that's not an emergency uh, in my world. But uh, if there's a sale happening at a certain shop that I won't mention and it's heels that I probably would never have afforded at their full price, then it's an emergency that I need to, I need to address. Do you find that people are very uh, variable, uh, Alex, about what constitutes an emergency and, and what constitutes it's a, a Western province versus shoes uh, incident. Very good point. In fact, you, we can use the word emergency as a necessity money. Mm. And necessity money is the things that you re really value. And if you value shoes and rugby, obviously that's a necessity. That is your emergency, as it were. But I think we need to take a definition of what emergency money is. It's really, it's really saving money for a rainy day. It's making sure that you've got money when you really need it. And as you correctly said, whether it's a car breaking down, emergency, somebody ill, or maybe for a burial society, we all need to have that necessity emergency money. But where do you put it? Because one of the things I find very interesting is the, psych the psychology of money, Huge. is how, how yeah. accessible that is. So if it's in an overdraft, I can go and I can stick my, my card in the machine and I can go and dra grab that money. If I put it into an RA, I can't touch it. You know, in theory, I can't touch it. Can I put it into a seven? Where do I hide? I, I know myself that I need to hide that money from, from being accessible to me on my debit card or on my um, internet banking or whatever. Where's a good way to put it where it's accessible but not too accessible? Well, maybe the ladies can expand on that a bit further. But <laughs> I'd like to maybe, in, maybe from your side, from gl what Glacier does, for example, but uh, the, thought, the thoughts that I had when you asked me to talk about the topic is basically it could be literally putting money in a cookie jar or under the bed. That would be for somebody emergency money. Mm. You could take it further and say a savings account with a bank. You take it one step further and you go into a unit trust. Mm -hmm. Take it one step further, it's access money and you know, your bond, your access bond. Mm -hmm. And of course the real emergency money is when war breaks out in your country and you've got these gold coins and you want to, you know, everything is, the woman's jewelry becomes <laughs> emergency money. So it depends on where you're putting it. So maybe How big should it be, Cathy, well, as well? Just getting back to the where, I, I, I am from Glacier, so I'm always going to say a wonderful, diversified Glacier portfolio is the way to go. But in all honesty, an emergency fund is not an investment. It's probably the least sexiest part of your, mm. of your greater yeah. portfolio. It's not an investment. You need to put it somewhere fairly low risk where you can access it easily mm. and quickly before you have the financial muscle of a nice share portfolio that's got lots of fat built into it so it doesn't matter if you dip into it into mm. a bear market or a home loan that's built up lots of equity and you can dip into that. An emergency fund are almost like the the ugly old brookies that you have to put on to hold everything Bridget together Jones? before you've got the muscle <laughs> to, to do it for you. Your emergency right. fund is that before you have your, your financial muscle in place. Then let me bring you back quickly in. Uh, how big should those Bridget Jones brooks be? Um, <laughs> advice that I got was um, 
your emergency fund um, should be about six to eight months of your monthly living expenses. Now, um, like um, Kathy said, this isn't um, an investment. You should always have this money. It's set aside. It's only and only for emergencies. You'll find a lot of people um, think that just because they've saved up X much, they can take it and start, you know, investing in unit trusts and ETFs and things like that. And whereas you need to be able to put that money in something like a money market account, where um, it's gonna do relatively well in terms of interest, but you have immediate access to it. If you're undisciplined, a 32-day notice account or a seven-day notice account is the best option. It's money, it's set aside, you know it's not gonna go anywhere, and when you need it, you just call the bank. And if you look at financial planner, the role in the financial planner, because I think it's one of the things that does get neglected in terms of sitting down with your financial planner and actually what if Scenarios. You know, exactly. Obviously, we get a lot of the the thing. Medical aid is a, is a, is a, is a simple example. We make sure we have enough cover. Um, do we have money for retirement? Yeah, that that should be part of a typical retire financial plan. Emergency cash on hand at the moment. Well, like maybe even just cash on hand. What's its role when you talk to your clients? You know, as I said, when things really go wrong, I agree with what Danae is saying. You need about three to eight months. You know, read the books, Rich Man, Poor Man, Susie Orman.